So you have the floor now. Casa Ricardo. So first of all, I don't only want to express my gratitude to the foundation of uh, Justice Garson, but I would like to express my gratitude towards him, to my colleague, to my friend. He's my colleague, even if he, at this point in time, he's devoted to other activities. He is my colleague, he is a judge, and he will continue to be a judge. And it will be him who decides when he wants to stop being a judge. So one of the hardest moments of my career was when he, Justice Garson was suspended initially. And well, at that time, his uh, career, his profession was his, his life. Um, well, I'm sure that he had found all the ways to walk or the paths to walk and as satisfactory as, uh, as in the past. So I would like to pay tribute to him from here. So second, uh, with regard to the small anecdote that Jose Maria mentioned, well, the Shilingo trial finished, and then I had to join um, a, a position in former uh, Yugoslavia, and I had the conviction pending, and I had no other way to do it or place to do it. Then I had the understanding of the president of the tribunal of the court at that time, and she allowed me to devote one month to the Chilingo case. and. Also, I had the opportunity to use the resources at that court. It had a wonderful library, and I also had wonderful colleagues with lots and lots of expertise and experience. Some of them, for instance, Almero Rodriguez, had worked at the FUMA Yugoslavia trials, and we were exchanging information regarding um, genocide, etc. He took care of the Katsik case. Uh, and he had quite experience on the topic. So regarding the topic and the discussion this morning, well, I would like to start by saying that I am a local judge. I had some international experience, but I see things from a local perspective. So at the end of the day, I am sure that I will gather collect some of the proposals put forward by Jose Maria, but in any way, I will try to share with you some of my reflections, some of my views, well, that I hope they are, they will contribute to the conclusions reached at the end of this conference. These reflections are reflections that have been gathered over many, many years of experience. I've been working in the uh, criminal division of the National High Court since for many, many years, and I've been seeing, I've been seeing the evolution of universal jurisdiction in this country. So it is important when we think about international courts and universal jurisdiction, we are talking about the same thing. We are talking about international criminal justice, universal justice, uh, to put it in a nutshell. And although they may have, we may have uh, precedents, uh, Nuremberg trials, etc. At the end of the day, this is a very new element that has, um, well, that uh, that developed or unfolded after the Balkans War. So that is to say, 20 years ago, and when the international community started to be interested in that. And uh, well, I'm sure that there is a simultaneous act that I always like to that I always mention. And actually, that was the meeting held in Vienna in June 1993 that resulted in the Vienna Declaration, where all the states got engaged or involved in the enforcement and defense of human rights. And therefore, at the time, there was also a commitment on the part of the states as well as on um, uh, bringing forward a, a number of joint uh, actions to enforce that. So a number of courts were born, and as well as the universal jurisdiction. So we found kind of interaction there, some underpinning or some mutual underpinning or support between these two, well, between the international tribunals and the states. And that also led to the creation of the necessary environment 
for the creation of the ICC. At this point in time, it is unquestionable that well, despite the universal jurisdiction in some countries, especially after the the time after the September the 11th uh, terrorist attacks. Well, we may have said that perhaps universal jurisdiction has been gone down a bit or has found lots of barriers and hindrances. We cannot really say that it has uh, declined at all, has decreased at all. It has won international justice. Universal justice is there, is with us. So those who are not ready to be subjected to it are out of the game. The rest of us trust universal jurisdiction. And actually, at the end, in the bottom line, so we see that all the players, all the actors of in universal jurisdiction, we see the degree of cooperation, of interaction, and the joint actions that they take. So universal jurisdiction is just one more piece, one more piece within universal or inter national justice. And then this piece has had, uh, has had several milestones. And actually, now perhaps it is time to consider how, what can we do so that universal justice continues to play the same role that has been playing so far? What happens with the states? And this is this conference gives us it's wonderful, it's a wonderful scenario to that would allow us to take a step forward so that many of us who are interested in universal jurisdiction bring together, come together just to move forward. The committee that will be drafting the document gathering the conclusions of this conference. Uh, well, I'm sure, or oh, I hope that this document is full of uh, rich material because we really we really hope we really hope in the work uh, that we cannot do for international justice i believe in universal jurisdiction and um, talking about international courts i believe it is necessary to set up a number of strategies first of all the strategies for justification for to have a supra legitimation of universal justice. So we should bear in mind what Jose Luis Mena said. Universal jurisdiction can play a very important role in terms of joint work carried out with international courts, and more specifically with ICC. ICC does not have a prosecutor, um, prosecutor office, you know, with lots of resources. They have to do to do the investigation locally. So states are the ones that provide the necessary resources so that ICC can carry out the necessary investigations. So therefore, it is, it is very, it's, it's essential that local jurisdictions can enforce universal jurisdiction in cooperation with the ICC. It is an obligation at least on the part of all the countries that have ratified the ICC and the countries that have established specific mechanisms for that cooperation. So one of the things that, um, that surprised me is when lawmakers, Spanish lawmakers, do not realize the obligation they have to cooperate with the ICC, and then that lawmaker establishes some limits for that cooperation. Well, but moving on with my presentation, I think that it is also very important that we realize that not only this cooperation with ICC is relevant, but also cooperation with third countries, with other countries. At this point in time, some countries are bringing or are have uh, mechanisms or elements to investigate genocide, crimes against humanity. So yesterday I discussed that with a French representative. This uh, French, France is one of those countries. Well, and also Belgium, where they have some units for 
in investigation task forces in Belgium, Sweden, Norway, as well Canada, as well as the US. So that means that is a creation of a stable, permanent structure to investigate crimes against humanity that also lead or allow to establish cooperation between other, uh, with other parties. So within the European scenario since 2003, we have been seeing important activities or actions on the part of the European uh, Commission about uh, genocide and uh, crimes against humanity. And then in the second act, in the second activity in 2003, they also went in the issue of uh, amendments. Of, well, they amended the document or the activities on genocide of 2002. And this is supported by Eurojust. So European justice, uh, European criminal justice is internationally involved. So all that leading to, uh, uh, to see how cooperation can take place, co cooperation with ICC can take place. So the idea is to set strategies so that universal jurisdiction can play specific roles. And probably the way to do so is to create an awareness and to establish mechanisms for cooperation between states. So that cooperation, well, I don't really like to use the word struggle, but let us say the legal treatment, legal treatment um, or the for the most heinous crimes, crimes against humanity, so that they are dealt with in a collective manner where roles are kind of uh, established or distributed so that each country would decide what to investigate or sometimes if another country is in a better position to do so could take care of the prosecution well in some so it is not a requirement or an obligation of universal jurisdiction that is to say, the actual enforcement of ordinary universal jurisdiction is not a question of initiating cases that will lead to prosecution and to a conviction. The idea is to carry out legal procedures, that is to say, to carry out, to start investigation, that the country that is in the best position to do so will do so. And then, of course, then to prosecute the perpetrators in the country that is most fit to do so, whether it is Spain or any other country. These are proposals for the future. At this point in time, there are mechanisms in place, and there is an international awareness. There is a national awareness and a will for the situation to be like that. Unfortunately, in our country, things have been seen in a different way, and other ways, other mechanisms on other or laws have been opting in and preventing the enforcement of universal rights. Well, but of course, we cannot really think that ICC, without ad hoc international tribunals, have the capacity to reach everywhere. And in those situations or circumstances where it is not possible for international courts to enforce the jurisdiction, perhaps it is then when the own the, the states themselves can exert that universal jurisdiction better. So universal jurisdiction, it is not about internal laws of domestic laws of the countries that want to enforce universal jurisdiction because the basis of universal jurisdiction are the international norms and treaties that establish specific obligations. For instance, Geneva Convention or Convention on Enforced Disappearances, but we also have a network or many international common law rules. They just established this system, this system of international rights, and it has a hard core, and that must be uh, respected, and that is binding to all the judges. And then at the domestic level, we establish what is the, how the judges should relate to the international law, which is law like any other law. And perhaps this is what makes the difference between the different judges. Perhaps approaches, 
such as the approach, for instance, at a point in time to uh, Justice Garson about the topic about what happened in Spain as of 1936. It was that that actually determined that our determined that our courts uh, issued number of resolutions. So, what I would like to say is that I support that Spanish judges have a clear awareness, uh, very clear that we have to assume international obligations to enforce universal jurisdiction whenever it has to be enforceable, and of course, cooperating with international courts. Thank you so much. For as for the Spanish judge, obviously, the question is, would it be bribery? If we talk about legislative and executive bodies in Spain, regarding the invasion of judicial powers which have narrowed down the level of application of the very much. Well, for obvious reasons, I'm just going to raise technical criticism against the law. It is technically deficient. It has been drafted uh, too rapidly. And it offers or legislates based on one case. Well, the law is no contribution, and I don't think it would achieve uh, uh, any purpose. And it also, um, we see a contradiction of the law versus the international law on uh, human rights. We will find ourselves in, every, in very difficult situations. So a law of this uh, kind, well, the amendments of the organic law of the judiciary power, especially Article 23.4, was intended by many governments in the past. However, they didn't dare to do it because it is extremely complex from a technical viewpoint. However, there are many, also many issues have to be de debated around that amendment. It is surprising that the law has been amended so fast, so quickly, and did not follow follow the set procedure to amend organic laws. So it deserves the worst of the possible criticism. Of course, it is a law. We, it is mandatory for us judges to fulfill or to enforce the law as long as they do not clash, uh, they do not contradict other preferential uh, laws. And Hugo has told us about the obligation of Spain to fulfill with international treaties through other treaties, treaties that oblige us to uh, comply or fulfill other treatments. The Spanish state has assumed those treaties, has signed those treaties and has to be consistent. And we, judges, are also the state, so therefore we have to enforce the norms as we uh, think uh, should be enforced, okay? Because that is our role and function. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I would like to uh, mention here the your good, your good answer, because the question was a bit provoking, so your answer has been correct, prudent, very prudent, so we can see that you are a great judge.